Hello everyone and welcome to another video. So today what I'd like to do is over the past several videos we've been talking about several different vector derivative operations and we introduced a lot of these ideas. We talked about a lot of different notation, went over some examples and I know that might have been a lot to consume over um, three separate videos. So I wanted to make this quick video just to summarize um, what the major derivative operators were and uh, their notation and I think what might actually be helpful is talk about what are the inputs and what are the outputs of each of these operators. So to start off, let's just start here on maybe these uh, first one, two, three, four. If you remember these four, the dot product, scalar projection, vector projection, cross product, right? We talked about those in this other previous video. So if you want details on the derivation on this, feel free to check out this previous video or check out the notes um, of this video. So if you scroll down to the description of this video, there's a link to a page where you can download all the lecture notes, see all this notation. So if something isn't clear on the board, you'll be able to just just get that in the lecture notes in the PDF. So anyway, let's just start off with this. So the first operator that we talked about, um, we were talking about just simple vector mechanics was a dot product, right? It was typically denoted like this, right? It was a vector with a dot and another vector, right? Or sometimes you use this inner product notation where you have the angle brackets, right? The thing that's important about the dot product, right, is that the input to this function or to this operation is you give it two vectors right? These vectors can be 1D, 2D, 3D, ND, right? It can be an arbitrarily long vector, but you give it two vectors. And what comes out the other end, it's just a scalar. It's just one number, right? And again, if you want to know how to perform this operation, check out that other video, right? But again, I just want to talk about the high level ideas. And most importantly, what are the inputs and outputs? What are the interfaces to all of these different operations? Okay. All right. So if we're happy with the dot product operation, the next operation that we talked about was the scalar projection operator. Sometimes it's referred to as the component of vector u on vector v. So it's projected vector u onto vector v, right? Again, the notation or the way you calculate this, it was actually the dot product of u and v divided by the norm of v, okay? So again, if you stare at this long enough, you see that again, the input to this is you give it two vectors. You give it a u and a v. What this gets out is a scalar, right? And we talked about what the physical meaning of this was. This was basically the length of the projection of uh, u onto v, right? That's what it was, okay? So we extended that idea then now, instead of having a scalar projection, we talked about the vector projection, again, denoted as the projection of vector u onto vector v, right? And again, all it was, it was basically the scalar projection, but now we're gonna give that a direction or a component or a, uh, yeah, basically a vector direction in the direction of v, right? So again, what's interesting is again, go, well, going into this, it's two vectors, but now what you get out is actually a vector as well, right? Because this is now pointing in the direction of vector v, right? Okay, so that was that. Um, okay, then next we talked about the cross product operation, right? Sometimes it's denoted as vector u crossed with vector v, right? And again, it was just, we saw there was an, there was an operation of how you compute the cross product, right? Um, I just put dot, dot, dot here. If you wanna see the actual um, way to compute the cross product, right? Check out the previous video or look at this particular video's uh, lecture notes and you'll see that. But again, the important thing about the cross product is now you give it two vectors, right? And then what comes out is another vector who has a property that they're, it's, it's perpendicular or normal to both of the input vectors u and v, right? So that was what the cross product did, right? Okay, so that was these four vectors. Now let's talk a little bit about how about the next two, the gradient and the directional derivative. And again, we talked about that in this video over here, right? So we saw that the gradient operation, right, sometimes referred to as grad f, or sometimes uh, del f or nabla f, right? It's basically an operation where you are taking the derivative of some scalar function in the x, y, and z locations, right? So in other words, what you give this thing is you give it a scalar or you give it a scalar function, however you want to think about this, right? The input to this is some function of, it's a function of x, y, z, right? But this function, it spits out a scalar, right? So in, in this case, it's, this function takes three inputs spits out one scalar, right? What the gradient does is it operates on this function, right? It operates on this scalar function and it produces a vector, right? Here's the X component, the Y component, and the Z component of the resulting vector or vector field, however you'd like to think about it, right? So that was the gradient operation. And then what we said is we could build on that idea to come up with this idea of what's known as the directional derivative, right? So the directional derivative is basically looking at how some function f changes if you move in a specific direction b, right? So we denoted it, sometimes you'll see it like this, the derivative of function f 
in the direction of vector b. And again, we computed it like this. Okay? So again, what comes into this, or what the input to the directional derivative operator is, you got to give it this scalar function like we saw earlier, right? But now you also have to give it a vector b to tell you which direction that you're interested in in investigating, right? And what this actually spits out is it spits out a scalar number, right? It's basically telling you the rate of change of the function in that, in that um, direction b, right? Okay, so that was the directional derivative. Okay, so now these last three operations, the Laplacian, the divergence, and the curl, we looked at that in this video over here. So again, check that out if you want to see the derivations or, or more detailed explanations. Instead, what I want to focus on right here is just sort of the notation as well as uh, the inputs and outputs in the larger picture of all of these different operations, right? So the Laplacian that we talked about, sometimes referred to as del L squared F or delta F, right? It was this, right? It's basically a, a bunch of second derivatives added together, right? So again, what goes into this is that same, you give it a scalar function, right? And what comes out is just one number. It's a scalar, or, or I guess you could think about it, another scalar function, right? Okay, so that was the Laplacian. The divergence, right, which we denoted as div v, or sometimes nabla dot v. And again, we made the uh, distinction, right, that you got to be careful about this dot, and this dot up here in dot product, you might think you could get confused here, but really, if you look at what the inputs and outputs of these two operations are, they're completely different types of inputs and outputs, right? So in the case of the divergence, what you do is you give it a vector field, right? Or um, basically a vector, right? A vector that could be varying with x, y, z, right? And what you do is you do this operation and what comes out is a scalar, okay? So again, I think this is helpful to see within the context of other potentially similar operations like the dot product, right? Where you notice now that even though the notation might be similar, the context is hopefully enough to, uh, to differentiate what does, a, what does a particular author mean? Are they talking about dot product or are they talking about divergence, right? And the story is also similar with curl, right? So curl of v, right, we denote it sometimes as del crossed v. And again, feel free to check out the notes if you want to see exactly how to compute this, right? But you see that what goes into the curl operation is you give it a vector and out comes a vector, right? So you give it, more, more importantly, a single vector, you get out a vector. So hopefully, again, you can differentiate this cross product from this cross product, right? Because you see that the inputs to these two things are different. Right? They're, they're, they're inherently mechanically different operations. So hopefully you won't be able to mess it. Uh, they, they just won't work if you try one operation in the wrong spot. Okay? So again, we just wanted to quickly summarize. Here are all of the different um, operations. Here's the inputs or the outputs of all these different operations. So hopefully this gives us a good idea of all of these different types of operators that we talked about. So. With that being said, let's now take a look at um, what about if we want to look at these operations in maybe cylindrical or spherical coordinates. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is spend a couple of minutes looking at a few of these operators um, in non-Cartesian coordinates, namely if we look at them in polar slash uh, cylindrical coordinates, as well as what happens if you want to do these operators in spherical coordinates. Now, obviously, um, make sure you have watched our video here talking about the, uh, yeah, the transformations between Cartesian, uh, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates, just so you have an idea on all of the definitions of the angles. In particular, what I want to draw your attention to is um, I'm going to continue using notation that's consistent with that previous video and what we've discussed in the past. Namely, I'm going to use theta to denote the azimuth angle and then phi to denote the inclination or polar angle. If you look at some other references like Wikipedia or other uh, textbooks, you may see that they actually use different notation for azimuth and inclination uh, slash polar angle. So again, just be a little bit careful of what context you're using it. I've seen uh, mathematicians use one set, whereas like engineers and scientists use a different set. But just make sure you're consistent, okay? So that being said, let's use this notation. And really, I don't think there's a ton to go over. Um, we talked about, for example, in the gradient, right? We understand what the gradient is, right? If you're given a function, which is a function of x, y, and z, we already talked about how to compute the gradient, right? Just take the derivative of each one of these um, of the function with respect to x, y, and z. That gives you the components of the gradient in the i, j, k direction or align with the x, y, and z axes, right? Now, if you change this now and you say, all right, instead, I want to describe this function in terms of cylindrical coordinates, right? With a radius, an azimuth angle, and a z value. Well, then the gradient of that function now, it's slightly different, right? 
Here's the component that is along the first dimension or the radial direction, the e hat r direction. Let's just take the derivative of the function with respect to r. Where it gets a little bit more interesting is like the, the, the gradient in the direction of theta or the e hat theta direction, right? If you take the derivative of the function with respect to theta, but then you have to multiply the result by one over r. So again, maybe what we'll do is highlight a few of these where you kind of get some interesting deviations. So maybe here's something that's, that's a little bit different. And then obviously in cylindrical coordinates, z is the same thing as the z in the Cartesian, so no difference here, okay? Now, it gets a little bit more complicated if you look at spherical coordinates, right? So now I'm going to describe this function f, or a position in the spherical space, using a radius, an azimuth, and an inclination angle, okay? So now the gradient is, okay, we saw this is pretty much standard in the radial direction, but now in the azimuth angle direction, you not only have to take the derivative of the function with respect to theta, but you have to tack on this term in the front of it, right? And similarly, for the, the gradient in the direction of the inclination angle, or the e hat phi direction, it's you take the derivative here, but you actually tack on this here, right? So a little bit different, okay? Similarly, let's look at the divergence, right? We already know what the divergence looks like in Cartesian coordinates, but now, if you have this vector field f, which is describing a, the, a field direction in the radial, the azimuth angle direction, and then the z direction, now its divergence looks like this. And again, you see a little bit different terms. You see uh, this term coming up again. Now, you, when you want to take the derivative of the fr, with respect to r, you actually have to tack on this r term in front, okay? And then similarly, uh, when you're taking the derivative with respect to um, the theta direction, or the azimuth angle direction, you get this term in the front, and then this stays the same for the z. And then again, spherical coordinates, it also looks a little bit more interesting, right? So now you got this term and this term here, you got this term here, then you actually have this interesting term and this interesting term inside of the partial, right? Okay, so that's gradient and divergence. Uh, give me a second to erase the board and let's look at the last two. All right, so let's look at curl and the Laplacian operator. So for curl, again, remember, if it's in Cartesian coordinates, the curl of this vector field with components in the x, y, and z directions was given by this, right? So you get another vector field with this component in the x, this component in the y, this component in the z. So now if you have that vector field, but it's described in cylindrical coordinates with a component along the r, theta, and z direction, the curl just looks a little bit slightly different. Um, and again, you pop up with a couple of these extra terms that um, are a little bit different than their Cartesian counterparts. And similarly, for spherical coordinates, it just gets a little bit more interesting. There's a couple more of these extra terms that you're going to want to watch out for. But again, if you're careful, it should just be a matter of turning the crank, right? Um, and here's one more red one, okay? All right, how about the Laplacian operator? So again, in, in Cartesian coordinates, the, the Laplacian of a scalar function f of x, y, z was pretty simple, right? It's just a bunch of all of the second um, partial derivatives added together. So if you have cylindrical coordinates, it's also still a bunch of second order partials added together, but they're just a little bit different with, again, you gotta watch out for a couple of these extra terms that weasel their way in there. And the weaseling gets a lot worse in spherical coordinates. So you get terms like this, this, this here, this here, and this here. And again, maybe I will point out, just to be very careful, this term here is sine squared. This one is just sine, okay? So, uh, yeah, a couple things uh, to mention. Maybe what I will mention is, again, check out the notes because I've got all of the details. It's written a lot cleaner here in the PDF. Also, um, there's a couple ways you can make some simplifications in some of these. So, for example, if you look at, uh, like, this term right here, Th this term right here in blue, right? This is what? This is d dr of the quantity r times df dr, right? You could product rule this thing and come up with uh, d dr of the first term multiplied by df dr plus that alone times d dr of the second term, which is df dr, right? So does everyone see how this, this just becomes 1, right? So I think this first term just becomes df dr plus r times, this here is just the second partial of f with respect to r, right? So you can make some of these simplifications and write these in different formats. And same thing down here. So you can simplify this. And again, check out the notes if you'd like to see those alternate formulations of them. But again, I think all we wanted to talk about today was give a little bit of a note uh, of a cheat sheet, so to speak, of how you can compute some of these different um, operators. Um, in different coordinate systems like cylindrical or spherical. So, 
With that being said, I think this is a good spot to leave it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if so, I also hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. The new videos come out every Monday, and I hope I'll catch you then, and uh, we can all learn something new together. So until then, I think I'll sign off. Talk to you later. Bye.